Okay. Today, uh, for the Pasha, we're going to do Rosh Hashanah because that's the Pasha of the Shabbos. And by the way, this is the last Monday night class until after Sukkot. But when, because next Monday night, it, it's Sem Gadaya, then it's in Kippur, then Sukkot. But the Mitzvah this Wednesday night's a class, and next Wednesday night between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur will also be a class. Okay, so tonight we're, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, insights to Rosh Hashanah what Rosh Hashanah is all about, and especially quantum Hasidic interpretations of it. And then we'll uh, get into maybe some practical things if we have time. Now, Rosh Hashanah is interesting. It's the beginning of the year, but it's not called Tchila Sashana. In Hebrew, the beginning of the year should be called Tchila Sashana, the beginning of the year. It's not called Tchila Sashana, is called Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Why is it called the head of the year? The Chassidus explains, just like the head of a person includes the entire body in, in, the, in the head, it feels it's the nerve center of the entire body, the same way Rosh Hashanah includes within it the entire year. Okay, well, well, I just want to figure out one thing. Okay, Rosh Hashanah includes within it the entire year is included in the day of Rosh Hashanah. Same thing we have Rosh Chodesh. Why is it called Rosh Chodesh, the head of the month? Because it's not only the beginning of the month, but the head includes within it. In the day of Rosh Chodesh, it actually includes within it the entire month. If you ask a Jew, a religious Jew in the street, what is Rosh Hashanah really all about? So they'll tell you, Rosh Hashanah is the day we have God for a good year, a sweet year, uh, forgiven for our sins. Uh, the Gemara, in fact, says on Rosh Hashanah, Hashem writes in the books, Sadiq and the righteous people are sealed right away for a good life. Uh, the wicked people are sealed for a bad life. And the in-between people, God uh, hangs it, so to speak. It's, it's loose until Yom Kippur. If the person repents and does tshuva, then they get a good year. If not, God forbid, it's something negative. But the bottom line is, according to Hasidus, Rosh Hashanah has a much, much, much deeper meaning. Yes, nobody's taking away from the fact that on Rosh Hashanah, the Gemara says, how much parnasa, how much lively do we have for the year is decreed on Rosh Hashanah. We have a lot of things going on in Rosh Hashanah. But there's a much deeper thing, according to Hasidus, what Rosh Hashanah is actually really all about. And that is what's called Binyan HaMalchus. Building the attribute of Malchus, or in, to simplify it, the coronation of the king. Now, which means like this. I'm going to elaborate on it because this is the whole concept of Rosh Hashanah. And then a lot of things are going to fall into place when we discuss different aspects of Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is not the first day of creation. In the davening we say, This is the beginning of your creation. Nevertheless, it's not the first day of creation. The Gemara says, Hashem created the world on the 25th of Elul, okay? On the 25th of Elul, the world was created. By the way, how do I get, well, Jonathan is in the big in the middle. How do I, he, nothing personal. How do I cut off that picture? What do I do? You need to go to gallery view, Rabbi. Yeah. Which is? It's a uh, top right hand corner. It should say either gallery view or spe uh, speaker view. Well, now it's, oh, one second. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. That's the personal Jonathan, but that's it. Okay. So then, what is, what is Rosh Hashanah? The, uh, the truth is, Hashem created the world on the 25th day of Elul. Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day of creation. 
if it's the sixth day of creation, how can we say that this is the beginning of creation? It's not the beginning of creation, it's the, be it's the sixth day of creation. So the answer is because other Elisha was created on Friday. Now, because mankind, and this we're going to elaborate on later, mankind is the essence of the purpose of the whole creation. So therefore, in reality, not in realistically, in, in historically, God created the world six days earlier. But the ultimate purpose of creation is actually the purpose of Adam Marisha. Now, what happened on that original Rosh Hashanah? On the original Rosh Hashanah, after Adam Marishan was created, Adam Marishan, I'm going through the historical events of Rosh Hashanah that we can understand all the things that we're going to be talking about. We'll understand it much better because we're going to understand the way Rosh Hashanah, what Rosh Hashanah really is. On that day of creation, other magician proclaimed God as king. In fact, one of the reasons why Hayom Yom Shishi B'Shabbos, when we daven and we say the sixth day, what is the yom of the week? Hashem Moloch Geyaz Lovish. Hashem is king and he dresses his honorable clothing, royal clothing. Why do we say Hashem Moloch on Friday? Because on Friday, the original Friday of creation, Adam Adishin proclaimed God as king. What Adam Adishin actually did was he gathered every creation, the Medrus says, animals, every creation, all the, crea all the creations, it says. And Adam Adishin said to them, Hashem, let's go sing and rejoice. Let's go to the one that made us. So what happened on the original Friday? Adam Elishan proclaimed God as king of the world. Melech Elam. Therefore, every year on Rosh Hashanah, we basically proclaim God as king of the world. So in Kabbalah and Chassidus, it explains the following. The coronation, we coronate God as king. When does the primary coronation, by the way, become? It becomes Rosh Hashanah morning by Tkia Shefer and the Musaf. That's when God is coronated as the king. So every year, it says, when the Rosh Hashanah is about to come, the entering, like this year, Friday night, right before Yom Rosh Hashanah begins, Hashem leaves the world. He says, I'm finished my royalty. I'm not, I may finish my kingdom. I'm not king anymore. You want me? Proclaim me as king again. So what happens on Rosh Hashanah? On Rosh Hashanah, we are actually coronating the king. We are reappointing God as the king over the universe. Just like it was the original year. Hashem wants us to do it just like Adam Adishan did it. Now, the question is, the obvious question, why couldn't we do it 5,781 years ago? And why can't the king last for all these generations? Why do we need to do it every year, a new coronation? Why do we need to make God king every year? So Chassidus explains, based on Tanya, that on every Rosh Hashanah, we mentioned this in the previous class, there's a new revelation of godliness that never existed before. Remember, if you remember, we spoke it says that it is the land where God's eyes are from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. So then it should have said forever. Why did it say beginning to the end? Because obviously it begins again. Because every year on Rosh Hashanah comes down a revelation of godliness that never existed before. And if that revelation of godliness never existed before, we need to re-coronate him to get that new revelation, so to speak. It's a new revelation that never existed. 
And Hashem wants that every year we proclaim him as king. So what is Rosh Hashanah in a nutshell? What is Rosh Hashanah really about according to Hasidus in Kabbalah? Yes, we daven for our health and wealth and happiness and to be blessed with a sweet year and a good year and everything good. But what is the ultimate purpose of Rosh Hashanah? As we say in davening, everything that's affected in the world, you should know that you are the one that affects it. You are the one that made it. Every formation should know that you formed it. And everything that has a soul in it, which means everything, should say, Hashem Elokei Yisrael Melech. So we say Malchus and Melech and Melech and Melech HaKadosh, everything Melech. Why is it? Because on Rosh Hashanah, by us saying the Psukim, the Psukim of Davening of Musa, that we proclaim God as King, and by blowing Shaifad, so it actually what happens is we have a greater revelation of God means God becomes king again. So therefore it's like this. of Rosh Hashanah, at night, Hashem leaves. The year uh, contract, so to speak, of being king is done. Hashem leaves. In fact, I'm not getting into it now. Chassidus asks the question, if God leaves the world, how does the world exist? And then the question is even more this year, because there's external chayas and there's internal chayas and Shabbos and Friday night, God also leaves the world. So this year is a very big question, how does the world exist from the night of Rosh Hashanah until Tzkiya Shefer? Don't worry, Siddhis has an answer for it, and the world exists. Don't worry about it. We're not going to disappear. The world exists. So what is really Rosh Hashanah all about? Rosh Hashanah is all about making God as king. Um al bakel mashallah, that God's kingdom is all over the place. That is what Rosh Hashanah is. Therefore, what is Rosh Hashanah? Who proclaims God as king? Adam Rishon, mankind. Therefore, when is this coronation of God? Not when he created the world on the 25th of, of Elul, but rather on Rosh Hashanah when we proclaim God as king. And again, we're going to discuss other things in this reference to this, and we'll see how a lot of things fit into place. Based on this, based on this, there's a problem. We know out of Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow Shaifer. Out of Rosh Hashanah, we don't say Tachnun. The last day of the year, we don't blow Shaifer. The last day of the year, we don't say Tachnun. So the Rebbe asks, in a letter, I don't remember which one it is, the Rebbe asks, one minute, if the whole purpose of Rosh Hashanah is to build up God as king, so what better way is there by blowing Shaifer? What better way would there be by saying Tachnun? What is Tachnun? Confessing our sins saying that God is the boss and we sin and he is the, the king. That's what, that's what Tachlon is all about. That's what confession is all about. So why is it that the day before Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow Shaifer, we just said Shaifer is what brings God down into the world. So now out of Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow Shaifer. And the question goes even more. It says in Alocha, why don't we blow Shefer in Russia, out of Rosh Hashanah? A whole month of Elul, we're blowing Shefer. The day right before Rosh Hashanah, we don't blow Shefer. Why not? There's two reasons in Allah. One reason is the month of Elul is customary. Rosh Hashanah is mandatory, biblically mandatory, to differentiate between the customary and the mandatory. So we take a break to show there's a difference between the month of Elul versus the, the month of the days of Rosh Hashanah. But there's another reason Halacha says, which is seemingly a strange reason. And it says to mix up the Satan, that he should think Rosh Hashanah is over. Which means the whole month we're blowing Shaifer, and now the day of Rosh Hashanah we stop blowing Shaifer. 
So now it says in Allah to mix up the Satan that he should think Rosh Hashanah is over. That's why it says in Allah, we don't blow shaita at Rosh Hashanah. So the Rebbe asks, and everybody asks this question, how dumb is the Satan already? The Satan is a Malach. The Satan is an angel of God. What do you mean the Satan doesn't? Let him look at a calendar. You know, you think you're going to fool the Satan? And if you fool him once, you're going to think you're going to fool him for 5,781 years? And the same thing it says, Halachically, not what the Baal Shem Tev said, but halachically, why don't we do Shabbos Mavarchim Tishrei? Why don't we say the Misha Asanisim? Why don't we bless the new month? And Halach it says to mix up the Satan. Why? The Satan shouldn't know when Rosh Hashanah is. Like this, you proclaim and show when Rosh Hashanah is, when Rosh Hashanah is. So the Satan, that he shouldn't know when Rosh Hashanah is, so what do we do? So we don't bless the month. Come on. Well, <laughs> What is that supposed to mean? So the Rebbe explains a very fundamental aspect and it's phenomenal. And that is as follows. I'm going to preface it with another complicated thing of this year. We know the Mishnah says, Yom Tev Rosh Hashanah Shechol Liyaz like this year. Rosh Hashanah that falls out on Shabbos, the Migdash Shayu taken, in the base of Migdash, they blew Shafer, Avaleba Medina, not outside of the, of whatever that means, it's Machlekes, but not outside the base of Migdash. Out of Yerushalayim, out of the base of Migdash, they did, we don't blow Shafer on Shabbos. But this year, Shabbos, Rosh Hashanah is Shabbos and Sunday. Shabbos, we don't blow Shafer, even though that's the biblical day of Rosh Hashanah is Shabbos, and Sunday we blow Shafer. The question is, it doesn't say anywhere in the Torah that when Rosh Hashanah is Shabbos, you don't blow. Why don't we blow on Shabbos? So the Gemara says, It's called Gzeda the Rabba. Rabba made this decree. From before Rabba, but Rabba was the one that publicized it. And Rabba said the following, not everybody knows how to blow Shafer. And therefore, what are we afraid on Shabbos? That an illiterate who doesn't know how to blow Shafer might carry the Shafer in the street to go to the wise men to teach him how to blow Shafer. The Shema Yavirenu Arba Amis Bishra And maybe he'll carry four cubits six feet in the public domain. So because of illiterate people, right, because they don't uh, know how to blow shaifer, and they might carry the shaifer, so because of that, nobody blows shaifer. So the Gemara, by the way, asks, how could the rabbis uproot a biblical din? The biblical law, you have to blow shaifer. How can the rabbis come and say no? Where do they get that authority from? And the Gemara says, again, in, in revealed part of Teirah and Halacha, the Gemara says that Yesh Kayach B'Yat Chachamim, the sages were given the biblical authority, Lakir Dove Men HaTeirah B'Shev V'Al which means the Chachamim were given the biblical authority to tell the people, don't do a positive mitzvah. The Torah, the, Hashem gave the rabbis, not today's rabbis, the Talmudic rabbis, the authority to say, don't do a positive mitzvah. They don't have the authority to say, eat chazer, eat non-kosher. They don't have a, a ability to say, go worship idols or desecrate Shabbos. Anything which is negative, they have no authority to, to uproot. But when it comes to biblical mitzvahs, the Chachamim were given that authority that they could uproot the mitzvah. So therefore, the Gemara says, how can they do it? They have that authority. Comes along Chassidus and adds, a, who puts a whole new dimension to this. And Chassidus asks one minute. The Rabbam says, 
Shafer, even though it's illogical mitzvah. Shafer represents the concept of tshuva. Uri Yeshenim Yishenatchum, the Ramam calls the passage that says, wake up from your sleep. Shofar, Shofar comes to the word Shapru. Shofar and Shapru are the same letters. Shapru Masechem means make your actions better. Better your ways. Chassidus explains that Shofar creates Binyan Amalchus, like we said before, coronates the king. So we're talking about something so fantastically great, so lofty. And because of a few illiterates, we're going to undo that concept of Shafer for so many great people, for the majority of the Jewish people. What is going on over here? So Chassidus explains, and there's hundreds and hundreds of my modern that explain this concept, that in reality, Shabbos does what Shafer does. What do you mean Shabbos accomplishes what Shafer does? Shabbos, Shin, Bey, Sof, the word Shabbos, is the same letters as Toshev, which means Tshuva. Shabbos is the letters of Tshuva. Toshev and Eshadaka. Toshev means to return Tshuva. So therefore, Chassidus explains like this. When Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, you don't need Shafer so much because Shabbos accomplishes what Shafer does. And therefore, it's done from God's perspective, so to speak. Hashem is the blowing the shirt. Hashem said, you guys don't have to do it, so he does it. So therefore, Hashem is saying, you don't have to blow Shafer because you don't need it. Therefore, Chassidus explains Therefore, because of these illiterates, because Shafer is not that important than Shabbos, because Shabbos accomplishes it, so therefore you don't need uh, Shafer on Shabbos. By the way, the same thing is this year Lulav. We're not going to bench Lulav on the first day of Sukkot, which is the biblical mitzvah of Lulav, is only the first day of Yom Tif. We're not going to bench Lulav on the first day of Sukkot this year because it's Shabbos. But what's interesting, and I mentioned this briefly in Shul, when Pesach falls out on Shabbos, the rabbis didn't say don't eat matzah. We eat matzah on Shabbos. So Siddhis explains what's going on. Shabbos does what Rosh Hashanah does, uh, what Shefer does. Shabbos does what Lulav does, but Shabbos doesn't do what matzah does. And therefore matzah you need to eat. By the way, a form of a joke, the world says, the expression, the world says, it means the people say, that cholent is even holier than shoifer. Eating cholent on Shabbos is holier than shoifer. Why? Because when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, <clears throat> you don't hear shoifer, but you eat cholent. That means, Shabbos is not great enough to take away cholent. Cholent you have to eat. Shafer, you don't blow. So cholent is even greater than sh- this is a joke that people say. Okay, next. So therefore, it's like this. Rabbi, it's, is that why Jimmy is so holy, my buddy? Yeah. One of the <laughs> many Jimmy. reasons. One of the many <laughs> Okay, anyway. So now there's two things. There's two things basically going on when things get done by themselves versus when we do them. Okay, I'm going to go off for a minute to something also fundamental in Yiddishkeit, even though it's not relevant to Rosh Hashanah, but it's Nagea, men and women. Many people have a misunderstanding of the concept of women freed from certain mitzvahs. Women don't have to put on tefillin. They don't have to wear tzitzis. They don't have to, they don't have a mitzvah non-stop learning Torah. They have to learn everything they need to do. Any mitzvah connected to time that's biblical, women don't have to do. So many people are of the impression, falsely by the way, that 
women are second class citizens, and therefore uh, they, they don't have to do those things. The truth is just the opposite. Men need to do mitzvahs, and this is relevant to Shefer and Tachnun and all these things that we're going to mention in a minute. Men need to do mitzvahs to connect us to Hashem. In other words, in order for a man to be connected to Hashem, he needs to put on tefillin. He needs to wear tzitzis. He needs to do the various mitzvahs we're commanded to do. The fact that women are not obligated in that mitzvah is not because they're second class. On the contrary, women are self-connected to God without having to do the mitzvah. In other words, women don't need the mitzvah to connect them to Hashem because they're self-connected. Whatever the mitzvah of tefillin does, the, the fact that they're a woman connects them to Hashem. But there's two things over here. When we don't blow shayfar, it's done to perfection because God does it. Imagine, God does it, it's done right. When we do it, you know, do we do it halachically correct? Do we have all the proper intent? Did we accomplish what we have to? That's a whole, who knows? When God does it, it's 100% great. That's one way of looking at it. There's a second way of looking at it is, when we do it, it's not as perfect as when God does it, but we do it. So there's an advantage in each one. And I always give an example. You can go to a cake, a bakery, and buy a perfect cake. Perfect. And then you can bake your own cake, or your kids can bake your own, their own cake. Trust me. Well, let's see. Uh, it's not, it might not be as perfect as the bakery cake. But the advantage of the cake they made is that they made it, rather than coming it from above. So when Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, yes, there's an advantage that Hashem is doing Shefer, and Shabbos by itself accomplishes what Shefer needs to do, and therefore it's a great accomplishment. It's perfect. But we didn't do it. Now, so coming back to Tachnun and Ed of Rosh Hashanah, when we don't say Tachnun, because Torah says not to say Tachnun, not because I just don't say it. When Torah says, don't say Tachnun, it's not that you're losing out, God forbid, what Tachnun accomplishes. Tachnun, according to Chesidus, accomplishes more than the Amida does, more than Shemon Esri. Shemon Esri, you're standing with your feet together. Tachnun, you're bowing. It's even a greater revelation, close to Bittu to Hashem than, than the Shemon Esri, than the Amida. But when Torah says, don't say Tachnun, everything that needed to be done is done automatically. We don't have to do it. If Torah says you don't need to blow Shaifer, you know why out of Rosh Hashanah we don't need to blow Shaifer? According to Chassidus. Because everything that Shaifer did was accomplished already. Out of Rosh Hashanah we don't need it. So the Rebbe's question initially was, to, to build, to, to make God king, for sure we have to blow shofar, for sure we have to say tachnun. The answer is no. The reason why Titus says don't blow shofar, and Titus says don't say tachnun, because Hashem said, you finished everything that you needed to do until now, it's done, perfect. Now, I'm going to finish it up to perfection. And that's how the Rebbe explains, and this is a, the only logical explanation, basically, of tricking the Satan, of making the Satan think. And the Rebbe says, no, it doesn't mean that you're fooling the Satan, that he shouldn't know when Rosh Hashanah is, or he should think that the Rosh Hashanah is over. The Rebbe says some, a different interpretation of not fooling the Satan. What the Rebbe says is, when it comes out of Rosh Hashanah, the Jews did everything they had to do in the month of Elul. Everything was perfect. What does it mean? And we stopped blowing shaifar. 
and the Satan sees, the Satan is an angel, is a great angel. The Satan sees one minute, the Jews don't need Shaifar, which means they accomplished everything they had to. So I have nothing to come to prosecute on Rosh Hashanah. The Jews are perfect. That's how you fool the Satan. Not to fool the Satan that he shouldn't know which day is Rosh Hashanah. Let him look on a calendar, he'll know. You can Google it. He'll find out when Rosh Hashanah is. The Rebbe says to mix up the Satan, La'arvev as a Satan means when the Satan sees that the Jews finished everything they needed to do to perfection, to the extent that now we don't need to say Tachman because it's done perfectly and we don't need to blow Shafer because the Shafer, whatever Shafer accomplishes, is perfect. The Satan says, you know what? I'm out of business. They did Shuvah, they're perfect. I have nothing to prosecute about. And that's why we don't say Tachlum, and that's why we don't blow shape in a deeper in a deeper sense. Now, on Rosh Hashanah, we greet each other by saying Shana Taiva Umesuka. And here's a very interesting, there's a few line letter from the Rebbe explaining this expression. You know, it'd be, it's a Torah expression. We should have a Shana Taiva Umesuka, a good year and a sweet year. What does it mean, Shana Teva Masuka? A good sweet year. What, to have a lot of candy, a lot of chocolate, a lot of sugar? What does it mean? What's the difference between good and sweet? And this is another interesting, the Rebbe says it, Mamish, in two lines, but I need to explain it that we should have said it. It's a beautiful verb, what the Rebbe is saying. In Perch of Zion of Tanya, Chapter 27 of Tanya. Now, the Rebbe speaks and asks a very simple question. The Bainini that we learned about in Tanya, not completely yet, but we learned a little bit about the Bainini, we learned can never become a tzaddik. Can never, ever become a tzaddik. So then, now, the Rebbe asks, what is the purpose of the Bainini coming down into the world? You fight, you fight. You fight and you will never win. You will never kill the eight Sahara. You have to be born with that ability to kill the eight Sahara. Only certain people are born with that ability. Every person could be a Bainini and not sin. But how in the world, what is the purpose of the Bainini coming into the world? Okay? And Al Tareb explains it over there in Tanya like this. When Rivka, you know, Yitzchak called an ace of bring me delicacies, I'll bless you. Rivka calls in Yaakov. She doesn't want Esav to get the blessings. She wants Yaakov to get the blessing. So Rivka says to, to, to Yaakov, li mat amim, what Yitzchak said, make for me delicacies, plural. Yaakov, I mean, Yitzchak said to Esav, and Rivka said it to Yaakov, make for me delicacies, plural. You talk about Yitzchok Avinu. He needed delicacies. One delicacy is not enough. He had to, you know, a real gazette, ten course uh, steak dinner. That's what Yitzchok Avinu was interested in. Why does he say, "Make me delicacies"? And now Tereb and Tanya says that this is Rivka and Yitzchok talking to the Jewish people, meaning God talking to the Jewish people. Yitzchok as Hashem's representative on earth is speaking to the Jewish people. And what is he saying? Make for me delicacies, plural. And now Rebbe explains, in food, there's two types of delicacies. There's a sweet delicacy, and then there's, I'll use the word, hot sauce delicacy. Sharp you know, strong, uh, jalapeno pepper, what do you call it, jalapeno pepper, huh? Jalapeno pepper, well, <laughs> the sharp stuff, yeah? So now the Rebbe says like this, there's sweet delicacies, and there's sour bitter delicacies, sharp delicacies, spicy. both spicy delicacies, both are good, people love both of them, but it's interesting, if God forbid somebody faints, 
You don't give him sugar to smell, to revive him. You give him spicy, sharp things to awaken him. And the Rebbe explains like this in Tanya, that the Rebbe says, there is a tzaddik delicacy. Tzaddik delic the tzaddik delicacy is good, 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 good. And then you have the bainani, or another thing in this respect, about tshuva. What is the delicacy of about tshuva? He sinned, and now he does tshuva. What is he doing? He's actually making the Avedis on the high level of tshuva. The Avedis become a mitzvah. If the Aveda becomes a mitzvah, that's a transformation of evil to good. And that is better than good as good. The tzaddik is a goody-goody, so to speak. He's a good, he's always good. Nothing new, nothing exciting. It's S-O-S-O, same old, same old. The Benini, or Jews like you and I, mm -hmm. that sin, and we do tshuva, and everybody does tshuva and Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. So what actually happens is we're transforming the bitter to make it a wonderful, sweet delicacy by God. And that's what the Rebbe says. This is what the expression Lashana Teva Umesuka means. The bracha that we give somebody, you should have a Shana Teva Umesuka. Good year means like a tzaddik. Everything should be open, good, proper, good. The whole time it's good. But then there's also Besuka. What is that referring to? That all the negativity should be transformed to positivity positivity. All the bad should be transformed to good. All the terrible things should be transformed to super good. That is what the expression is very interesting. Everybody says Shana Tevah but the Rebbe actually explained it based on the Stanya. And with the Shana Tevah Mami a few lines on the Rebbe. But he says, like the Alter Rebbe explains in Tanya, Parak of Zion, and he says very briefly what he says. Meaning, we wish each other you should have open good like a tzaddik, and it should be even a greater level. Masuka is when you change bad to good, if the darkness to light, and that that is actually very 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 sweet. Okay. Um, okay, I'm gonna let's see. I don't know how much time we have, so I, I want to mention um, a few a few more practical things about what Rosh Hashanah is all about. A person asks this year many times, you could call it false humility. A person comes along and says, who am I to coronate God as king? Who am I to make the, whole, the world a dwelling place for God? Who am I? Who am I? Me, ani, me, ani, mo, ani. Who am I? What am I? And people, some people really mean it. There's, there's six to seven billion people in the world. I'm one seventh billionth of that. What do you expect I could do? You think I could do anything? Who am I? You think God cares if I do anything? That's what people, what, what, what in the world? Uh, I can't change the world. So Rosh Hashanah comes and says you could. What's Rosh Hashanah all about? Creation of man. When God created the world, he didn't create one animal, one lion. He created many lions. God didn't create one tree. He created many trees. God didn't create one drop of water. He made trillions of drops of water. Everything in creation, God created in multitudes. Vast amounts, except one thing. Adam Arishan was created individually. And the Mishnah asks, Lama Nivra Adam Yechidi. Why did God create one man and then made Chava from Adam? 
Why didn't God make a million people? When he created, just he created one. He could have created a million at the same time. So the Mishnah in Sanhedrin asks the question, Lama nivra adam yechidi, why in the world did God create the one man, one person? And the Mishnah says, because chayev kol echad ve'echad, it's a Mishnah Sanhedrin. Chayev kol echad ve'echad leimad, every single Jew. Every single Jew, the Mishnah says, every single Jew is obligated to say, the world was created for me. That could sound very egotistic. The whole world was created for me. So therefore, the Rambam comes along in Hilchus Tshuva, and he says, what does it mean when a person says, the world was created for me? And the Rambam says, very simple, very profound, and everybody knows this. Ramam says, when you are about to do one thing, thought, speech, or action, you should picture the world as an equally balanced scale. Good and bad are on the scale of the world equal. You do one mitzvah, you weigh the whole world down to good. You do an Aveda, God forbid, you rule drag the whole world down into evil. So what does it mean, Bishvili Nivra Ha'ilam, the world was created for me? What the Gemara says, and Chassidus has a field day with this, that every person, the Gemara, the Mishnah says, has to realize that my one action actually affects the entire universe, not the world, the universe. If I do a mitzvah, it drags the whole world to good. I do, God forbid, a sin, it drags the whole world down to bad. So the Torah says, this is the whole thing of Rosh Hashanah. What is the whole concept of Rosh Hashanah as far as we are concerned? What is Rosh Hashanah as far as we are concerned? A person must realize the ability from Rosh Hashanah, the first Rosh Hashanah, when God created one man, teaches us the power of a one individual. And not only the power of one individual, the power of one individual's individual act. And the Rambam says, one thought, one speech, or one action. Machshav achas, dibar achas, maise achas, the Rambam says. Machriya as atzmei v'chol ha'olam kulei l'kav schus, he drags the, drags the whole world down to good, and then the Ramam concludes, or oh, maybe Yeshua v'hatzoli, he brings salvation. That means when I do one mitzvah, I affect the entire universe. God forbid when I do us an Aveda, I drag the whole world down to terrible, to, uh, to, to terrible things. And this is the uniqueness of Rosh Hashanah. All the other holidays, all the other holidays were instituted for miracles. Think about it. Rabbi mentions this in a Sikha. Pesach, the miracle of leaving Egypt. Shavuos, the miracle of Mat and Teira. Sukkot, that God made the clouds. He, uh, you know, we... Uh, he made the cause, he put us in Tahat, all celebrating miracles, supernatural things. <laughs> what is Rosh Hashanah celebrating? The natural creation of the world. It's the only holiday that's not established for a miracle. Rosh Hashanah is because that's the day God created the world. And you know something? In the world, God created what's called Daimem Tzemeach Chai Medaber. Inanimate, plant, animal, and human. If you look in quantity, inanimate has the most in, quality, in quantity. Of all the creations in the world, the most of them are inanimate objects. Every, every 
drop of water, every kernel of sand, every kernel of dirt, every rock, every stone, every mountain, it's all inanimate. In quantity, the most that exists in the world is inanimate. Second most is plant. There's a lot of plant, but not as much as inanimate. Third, least in quantity is animal life. Least of all of them is humans. So in the fourth element, four things that God created the world, inanimate, plant, animal, and human, in quantity, inanimate has the most, then plant, then animal, and then human. In quality, in quality though, it's reverse. Mankind is the highest level of quality. We can think, we can rationalize, we can create you know, the power of a human being. Second to a human are animals. Third is plant. They grow, and then inanimate is the least. So it's interesting. God created inanimate plant, animal, and human that in amounts, the inanimate is the most, then plant, then animal, then human. In the quality, in ability to accomplish, is people, then animals, then plant, and then inanimate. From people themselves, the Torah says about the Jewish people, Atem Amahat Mikolo Amen, you are the least of all nations. Right? You're the least of all nations. You're the minority of all nations. Yet, what the Jews accomplish in quality is unbelievable. Who keeps God as king of the world? Who proclaims God as king? Jews. Who does mitzvahs to be, keep God in the world? Jews. Mitzvahs are called the bread of God. Like karbanis are called lachmi, the bread, the, the, the sustenance of God. What does food do? Food keeps the neshama in the body. In order for the soul to remain alive in the body, you need to eat. If God forbid you go on a hunger strike and you don't eat for who knows how long, you're going to die, God forbid. What is the purpose of food? The purpose of food is to keep the neshama in the body. What is What are mitzvahs? What are learning Torah? What are mitzvahs? That is God's food. What do you mean God's food? We want to keep God in the world? To function in the world? To bless the world, we need to feed him. God is the soul. The world is the body. How do we feed God? The mitzvahs. God said, that's my food. How do you feed me? How do you feed Hashem? Hashem says, you do a mitzvah, you're feeding me. Where do we do all that? In nature. We can't do mitzvahs out of nature. What is Rosh Hashanah all about? And this is the greatness of Rosh Hashanah in, in Jewish life. What Rosh Hashanah is really all about. And in certain respect, it's even bigger than Yom Kippur. It's even bigger than Yom Kippur. What is Rosh Hashanah all about? Rosh Hashanah is about nature, celebrating nature, creation of the world, which is nature, and the creation of mankind, which is the supernatural bringing of God into nature. And that's why Chassidus explains like this. In Davidin, we mentioned before, the world was created on the 25th of Elul, right? Six days before Rosh Hashanah. In fact, yesterday was the birth today. No, today. Today was the birthday of the world, 25th day of Elul. Today the world was created. God made light, God made everything on the first day. Chaf Hey Elul, 
is the word koi. And Rosh Hashanah we say, ze hayoyim tchilas masacha. Ze means this. This, you point to it. The Gemara says, ze is mare ve'etzba. When the Jew says, ze keli, this is my God. The Gemara says, ze means you point to it, this. You see this? If it's not in front of you, you can't see this. This means it's right in front of you. It's revealed to you. What does it mean Rosh Hashanah is called Zeh? And the creation of the world is called Chafei Kray. So. Kray in Hebrew means so. The Gemara says, all the prophets prophesied with the word Kray. Look in any of the Haftars, Ko Amar Hashem, Ko Amar Hashem, Ko Amar Hashem, so God said. Meish Rabbeinu, the Gemara says, on the other hand, Nisnaba B'zeh, Zeh means revealed, Zeh HaDover Shetziva Hashem. So the Medrash says, all the prophets who are not as great as Meish Rabbeinu, they said, Ko Amar Hashem, so God said. Meshe Rabbeinu said, this is what God said. It's a revelation versus concealment of the prophets. So Chassidus explains what is the day of Rosh Hashanah all about. Zeh hayem tchilas masecho. Zeh is to reveal godliness in the chafei, in the kai, in the concealment of the world in the nature's creation of the world, which the word olam world means halam concealment. It means that the world conceals God. What is the role of the Jew? What is the role of the Jew to reveal godliness in the world, in nature? So what does Rosh Hashanah actually commemorate? Not miracles like Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot, or Purim, Mechanika. Rosh Hashanah is a celebration of godliness in nature. The transformation of nature into godliness. How? By showing that the world and God are synonymous. How does a Jew show the Rosh Hashanah? How does a Jew show that God and world are synonymous. On Rosh Hashanah, you blow shayfa, you make God as king. You do mitzvahs the whole year, you make God king. You make a bracha. Baruch Hashem, Elokeinu, Melech You make a bracha, you do a mitzvah, you're making God king. This is the power of Rosh Hashanah. Which means, when it comes to the time of Rosh Hashanah, you can't come along and say, a person says, okay, you think God really cared if I sinned? Who am I? I'm a nothing. I'm a nobody. You think God really, compared to God, for sure, I'm a nothing. You think God really cares if I sin or not? You think God really cares if I did a mitzvah? Yeah, God cares. Because Rosh Hashanah is all about the creation of one individual man in a vast world of inanimate plant animals, which in quantity, quantity is infinitely more than mankind. And what God wants is that a Jew on Rosh Hashanah is Zahayom Tchilas Masach. And therefore, this explains an interesting story. Now, the Rebbe said that on the first night of Rosh Hashanah, you have to be happy. You have to have Simcha the first night of Rosh Hashanah. So the Tzamech Zedek, his grandson, and another grandson of the al Rebbe, his name was Reb Nochem, who was the son of <coughs> the Mittel Rebbe. So Mechzarek married the Mittel Rebbe's daughter. So this is the son-in-law of the Mittel Rebbe and the son of the, of the Mittel Rebbe. Uh, <coughs> besides the fact that Rebbe was, I mean, so Mechzarek was anyway his grandson from his mother. So they came over to him and they said, but we saw you crying tonight. It was the night of Rosh Hashanah. The Rabbeim used to daven, many of them would daven for hours, six, seven hours, the Mayrev of Rosh Hashanah night. The Rebbe didn't, to our knowledge. But 
the three the previous Rebbe, the Rebbe Rashab, the, they all daven hours and hours and crying on the night of Rosh Hashanah. So they came to the Alt Rebbe and said, how are you saying that you need to have simcha the night of Rosh Hashanah when you cried? What type of simcha is that? And the Alt Rebbe said to them, my tears were tears of joy. Perhaps, I didn't see an explanation for this, <clears throat> but perhaps the explanation could be based on what we just said. Yes, you need to have this humility, this subservience to realize that if God is my king and I want to coronate God as my king, that means I need to be completely subservient to the king. If I want to accept the king as king, I must be completely bottled, completely subservient. And seemingly, that makes me a non-existent entity because I'm a nothing. I'm compared to, I'm making God my king and therefore I'm a nothing. But the reality is just the opposite. By being completely subjugated and bottled and subservient to God, we actually become a real entity. Because if we're connected to God, is there a bigger entity than God? Is there a greater entity than God? Is there a more real entity than God? No. So as long as I feel myself as a separate entity, I come, I go, I'm born, I die, we're not real. We're not eternal. When a person becomes subservient to God and they proclaim God as king and we are completely given over, give ourselves over to whatever God wants, whether we understand it or not, or whether we like it or not, that is the great accomplishment that we actually become something. And therefore, Dr. Rebbe said, you, it's, Dr. Rebbe was crying, but it was tears of joy. Because we realize at Rosh Hashanah, by making God our king and meaning it, that we become the entity of the king. The slave of a king is a king. Evid Melech Melech, the Gemara said. The servant of the king is the king. So therefore, when Rosh Hashanah comes, we need to understand, to wrap this all up, okay? In, in a nutshell, so to speak. To wrap it up. When it comes to the time of Rosh Hashanah, we're actually proclaiming God as king. And the Avaid of the Jew finished already before Rosh Hashanah. And therefore, we're completely subservient to God. And therefore, God says, I will be your king now. We say the Psukim of Mosef, we blow Shafer. That Kabbalah Chassidus explained the Shafer is actually bringing down God into the world in an infinite form. And we realize that me and you as individuals, or you and I to be more correct in English, you and I can accomplish that infinite accomplishment of one good deed that I do, one tiny little deed, brings down and reveals the infinite God. And we bring the Zeh, the revelation, into the, into the concealment of the world. We bring a, what greater revelation is that? And as Rebbe said, I mean, there's a whole long explanation for that. But when we become connected to God, what actually happens is, instead of being a limited creation, which is finite, we connect ourselves to the infinite God as creator. So can you imagine you do a mitzvah, instead of being a finite creation, we turn to be an infinite creator because we're connected with Hashem. So everybody should have a Shana Teva, Masukah, Ksivach, Sima Teva. Hashem, next Monday, there's no class because it's in Gedaya. The Monday after that is, is Yom Kippur, then Sukkot. So the next Monday night class will be after Sukkot, maybe a week after Sukkot. But this Wednesday night, there's a class. And the next Wednesday night between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur will also be a Zoom class at 8 o'clock. Everybody should have a very, very good year. Hashem should answer all our trillers. Amen. 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 Sukkot. We heal good uh, in all good aspects. Amen. All of us with the and the zone and the and the
And we should have a feeling of redemption with Mashiach because once that happens, everything goes to self. Quick question. Yeah, one second. Yeah. Um, in the era of Mashiach, will there be the avoda of the Bainan? Because you were saying how it's so important, the, the avoda of the Bainan. Will, no. will it apply in the time of Mashiach? No. We're going to be on the highest level of Shuvah, which is even higher than the Tzaddik. Wow. That's amazing. Right. That's why Thank the, you. The to do tshuva. Okay, that's for another class. Maybe between our Shani and Kippur, we talk about this stuff. Okay, guys. Have a great day. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, Rabbi.